And welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe, located at the intersection of faith and reason. I'm Doug Keck, your host here from our EWTN studios in Irondale, Alabama on Mother Angelica Way. It's the mothership as we move through space each week here at EWTN. You know, we depend on your feedback. Send us your emails. Check us out on Facebook. Tweet us on Twitter. And for all things Father Spitzer, two places to go, themagiscenter.com and also there's crediblecatholic.com, two wonderful sites to get a lot of information, not only about Father Spitzer, his wonderful work, and also as we march through with our topic today, talking about the uh, universal salvation of our Lord. And uh, speaking of one of the things that I think is very important these days is conversion stories. You know, uh, uh, Mother Angelica founded the whole uh, Journey Home program years ago with Marcus Grodi and had him do the show. And, uh, you know, he wrote the introduction to this particular book entitled uh, From Atheism to Catholicism. But a lot of people don't realize these are really episodes of the Journey Home show, those shows you love. And, and a couple of these feature people you might know, like uh, I know Rhonda Chervin, of course, and... Uh, also, Joe Pierce is featured in here. But, but what's interesting of this and ties into this show is it talks about people who were atheists and came to the love of the church and so much of Father's uh, work here on EW10. Of course, in this program is featured on reaching out to young people who are struggling with agnosticism and atheism. And with that being said, let's move to Father Spitzer. Good to see you again, Father. How's the weather out there on the West Coast? Good. Oh, the weather's just perfect. Uh, I shouldn't be saying that. I know our poor Midwest viewers are uh, probably not uh, in the same mood. Right. But uh, in any case, it is uh, wonderful, and it's great to be with you, Doug. As always, so if you get us started with a prayer, Father, and we'll start talking sure. about uh, today's topic and some other things. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the many blessings you give us particularly the blessing of your son's revelation of our resurrection and salvation through his passion, death, and resurrection. We ask you, Lord, to send your Holy Spirit down upon Doug, myself, and our whole audience this day so that everything we say and everything that's listened to will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your church, your kingdom, and your people. We ask you, uh, Lord, to continue to bless your church at, at this time as our Holy Father and the bishops uh, try to face the challenges which now beset our church. And we ask all of these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And speaking of that, Father, uh, of course, we're talking about the universality of Jesus' salvation. We're we'll talking about that mm -hmm. in the second half of the program. But as you mentioned there, uh, the idea of what we just came out of, obviously, uh, last week with the meetings in mm -hmm. Rome and obviously the, the quote-unquote priest scandal, and the abuse scandal and things like that. Uh -huh. And in some ways, seeing that, uh, as bad and as horrible as it is, it's at least opened up the question and an opportunity for us to uh, diagnose and deal with the issue. And one of the things that's also happened recently is uh, that whole idea of, the, of what happened in New York and what was going on in yep. some of the other states mm -hmm. where there was mm -hmm. this kind of uh, overreach, so to speak, from a pro-life perspective, obviously, in, in bordering on infanticide. And, and again, yeah. sometimes because what seems like the worst happens and brings out our Lord makes it into good or has good fruit come out of it. And here we have a, yeah. uh, a Knights of Columbus commissioned uh, Marist poll that says that basically Americans are now just as likely to identify as pro-life as pro-choice. This is a large increase from a similar survey le just a month before, just a month before. Yeah. And the poll marks the first time since 09 that the same amount of Americans identified as pro-life and pro-choice. And also the number of de Democrats now identifying as pro-life is 34 percent, up 20 percent from last month. And there's a lot of other statistics. People can check out the night site and get more information on this poll. But it's interesting. Again, we have this horrible thing going on in New York and being jumped on yeah. board by other states. And we're getting this incredible mm -hmm. contra reaction. 
Oh, no, it's, it's just perfect uh, div conspiracy of divine providence, if I might call it that, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, truly, you know, when you look at the number of Democrats going up from 14 percent to 34 percent, that's more than a, dub a doubling. It's, you know, literally a 20 percent increase off a 14 percent base. I mean, it, it's truly extraordinary. Um, and so uh, uh, we're seeing really, really good fruit. I think people have just been really, uh, you know, struck in their conscience mm -hmm. with what is going on here. And, you know, for the first time, they're not going to blindly follow the lead of political parties, uh, you know, no matter how you know, demagogic, mm -hmm. you know, those, the, the, you know, the party might be, or not just the party, but the people in the party, they're just going, no, we're not going to, as we said, you know, two weeks ago, we're not taking it anymore. Right. You know, this is just, uh, this is simply wrong. You know, you're, you're talking about infanticide. It's not just infanticide. It's not just you know, like infanticide, it, it is mm -hmm. infanticide. I mean, this is a, a baby essentially coming out of the birth canal. I mean, you know, to, to kill that a child is to kill literally an infant. Uh, and, and, you know, we're de dealing with, you know, technicalities of, you know, well, did it cross the birth canal? Or not? You know, uh, what are we talking about mm -hmm. here? This is a, a, a clearly an infant. And, and so I think people are just struck uh, you know, and, right. and uh, like I said, you know, it's not only that the, the, we now have a 50% pro-life, uh, um, de mm -hmm. declared pro-life stance, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, with all the pressure on people to not declare it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an extraordinary event that's taking right. place. And as, you know, these events continue, the good side that, I mean, it's, it's a terrible thing that's being done, but the good side that's coming out is it's really not just tweaking people's conscience. It's, it's just, you know, sledgehammering people's conscience, and they're, they're really s saying no to, to even right. our, our, our uh, you know, most ardent demagogues out there. Right, and, and also in thinking of the people that you speak to many times, young people, and yeah. uh, younger Americans have moved dramatically now, dividing 47%. Uh, to 48 uh, percent pro-choice. One month ago, the gap was almost 40, an average of 40 points, with only 28 identifying as pro-life and 65 as pro-choice. So this, again, has, I think in some ways, because it's brought forward an issue that a lot of people in their minds have decided, well, that's not an issue for me anymore. I, d I don't think about that anymore. And because I'm overall a member of this kind of democratic uh, perspective of helping people, in a sense, getting caught yeah. up or tangled up in the seamless garment and thinking, well, these things are all very good, uh, so that's more important than just worrying about this quote-unquote one issue. Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, again, it's so extraordinary, I mean, to see, you know, a statistical leap of this magnitude mm -hmm. taking place over, you know, a couple, three weeks is you know, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling for mm. any statistician. Right. And, and so, uh, because it is uh, a truly extraordinary, it's a, a change, uh, you know, almost, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a sea change, as, as people call it, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, uh, in our culture. And, and that is fantastic because this can be capitalized on, mm -hmm. we can build a base on it because I think people are just reaching the limit Right. You know, and uh, uh, the, the, the hand has been overplayed by um, the uh, pro-abortion uh, advocates, and it's been so overplayed, mm -hmm. it is creating for them a public relations nightmare. For us, it's just a public relations dream. Right. Uh, but we have to capitalize on it, and we now have to start levering this politically. Mm -hmm. And so I think people uh, in, the, in the states right now where a bill has been dropped or is about to be dropped uh, that it has a similar kind of character to the New York bill, in other words, permitting um, you know, for all intents and purposes, infanticide. Right. Um, if you are in one of those states, Illinois, Vermont, Rhode Island, if you're in one of those states, now's the time, you know, believe me, your state legislators know 
these statistics. Mm -hmm. And if they don't know, they will soon know them because, you know, they, they have tracking poles. And, and, of course, when you start calling mm -hmm. and all of a sudden their phones start lighting up, and these would be your, your state assembly people, your right. state senate people, if you start calling them up right now in Vermont, Rhode Island, Illinois, mm -hmm. where, you know, and, and, of course, Virginia, what am I saying? Mm -hmm. um, you know, as this begins to happen, um, they're going to be cognizant to the fact that they are now vulnerable mm -hmm. because the statistics are showing this cultural sea change and um, I think really we can capitalize on this and start levering this good news right. statistically, which believe me, these, right. uh, you know, politicians are always following the tracking polls. Mm -hmm. uh, they know. So if you're calling up and you're adding fuel, as it were, to the pro-life fire, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, it's really going to make a difference in those states. Right, so exactly. please call your state assemblymen, your state senators, and also please uh, talk to your priests about you know speaking on this issue even if but a, for a, you know two minutes in the homily mm -hmm. or even if it's just you know to make an announcement after the mass is over you know that you know this is something that really uh, has to be you know right. contended with you know to to have them m mention something about you know infanticide right. you know what is this saying about our culture what is this doing to our culture what is this doing to right. our people our young people what is this doing to our church right right exactly and it's interesting and i want to ask you this question uh before we get to our other questions is one of the things that obviously being a uh, a new yorker and coming from the northeast uh, you know, you look mm -hmm. at uh, analyses of the church and you look at what states have these giant amounts of Catholics in them. And then, unfortunately, mm -hmm. the correlation between being pro-choice and having large numbers of Catholics seems to be what it is. The question is, how could places like Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New York, yeah. which are heavily Catholic, uh, have be on the cutting edge of this infanticide? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think it's what I call um, compartmentalization inside, not just the brain, but inside the soul. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I think people say, well, I'm a Catholic, you know, and, and they, they, they look at this from the vantage point of religious conversion. So that means I go to Mass, I have a relationship with the Lord. Uh, at least ostensibly, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you know, and I, I go to confession once a year or whatever, and and then all of a sudden, the uh, in the other compartment, there's morality. Mm -hmm. So the moral conversion part is not hitting the, the religious conversion part, and I don't know what it is, but the the compartmentalization is so complete sometimes that uh, you know people think you know there's you know what Christ has taught you know, vis-a-vis -vis moral teaching, right, that this somehow doesn't impact their relationship with him, mm -hmm. um, you know, when they uh, are advocating strongly for something which is so contrary uh, to Christ's teaching, so contrary even to the Ten Commandments, so contrary to the revelation of God, it, it, it's just mind-boggling how this separation has occurred. But I do believe it's what I call compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. And I have seen people who are, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, weekly, uh, you know, they go to weekday mass and they, you know, they, they really do have a, a, you know, a prayer relationship with the Lord. And yet they do not allow this to touch their moral convictions or the formation of their conscience. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I don't understand it because for me, uh, this was never a problem in a way, you know, mm -hmm. having that relationship with the Lord, believing in His unconditional and merciful love, yet at the same time knowing, hey, I'm responsible to following His teaching. Uh, what does Jesus keep saying again and again? Mm -hmm. You will be my disciples if you uh, obey my commandments. Mm -hmm. You know, you are my friends if you obey my commandments. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think there, it could be any clearer, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for us to sort of, you know, feign that, you know, we are in relationship with him when we make no attempt mm -hmm. whatsoever uh, to, to, to follow what he's teaching and to do what he's teaching. 
um, it, it just it boggles the mind, honestly. And and I mean, yet it, it, we don't have to be complete successes. Mm -hmm. And the Lord knows I'm not a complete success. You know, uh, I mean, uh, there are many teachings that I try to follow, right. but I can you know flare up or do whatever you know. And and uh, uh, these things can happen. But you know, my point is that compartmentalization right. of morality. It, it, it's 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 right. another one of these diabolical plots, right. and and the devil has just done it so well. Uh, people sit there in complete uh, isolation. The, the two compartments are isolated. Nothing touches anything else, and they go mm -hmm. on blithely through life. And um, right. uh, just totally amazing, but totally wrong. Mm -hmm. Totally wrong. Right. Exactly. Okay. Let's get into some questions that uh, came in over the last sure. week or so. Uh, first up, dear Father Spitzer. Last week you answered a question about God being pure in mercy and justice. I was not totally yeah. clear on the difference between world justice, the world's justice versus God's justice. If justice does not entail punishment, then what exactly does it seek? Could you please elaborate a little more? God bless. This is from Mario. Uh, uh, Marion? Um, yeah, here's the basic answer. There's four kinds of justice. I'm not going to go into all of them right now, uh, but there's one that's called distributive justice, commutative justice. These deal with getting to equity or equality. There's retributive justice. That deals with the justice of the law. So when you're talking about does uh, a state, for example, have the right to punish somebody or to lock uh, somebody up, incarcerate somebody, uh, if they have disobeyed the law, the answer is yes, and that would be retributive justice. And and of course, then there is what's called restorative justice. That mm -hmm. is to say, uh, when people have been, uh, you know, underprivileged or or uh, you know have not had an education, and then they've gone out and done things which are pretty much a, a, a result of maybe they uh, uh, they didn't have economic means, or you know they grew up in a very abusive household or mm -hmm. whatever, and they do things that wouldn't be uh, ordinary, it, what's the best kind of justice for them? Well, it's to, to give them some means of doing better in the future, a sort of restorative justice. Mm -hmm. Now, these four kinds of justice, uh, you know, they, they have different objectives, right? So, uh, you know, um, uh, again, you, you could do an entire show on the four kinds of justice, but uh, sometimes if you can just go to maybe a, a Wikipedia page mm -hmm. uh, and just take a look, they'll, they'll uh, you know, under justice, they'll probably break down all four kinds of justice definitionally for you. Mm -hmm. And so you can see that. Now, when we're talking about justice as a virtue, mm -hmm. we're normally talking about it in the first two senses of distributive commutative justice. That is to say, what we're trying to do is seek the common good or trying to seek equity among people mm -hmm. so that you know people get their just desserts, uh, it, not in the sense of punishing them, but that we give every person their due. So their property, what's coming to them if, we, if they're doing work for us or we've made a contract with them, and that we're not taking something away from them that belongs to them. You know, distributive justice, pretty clear. Uh, Communitive justice, operating toward, you know, uh, trying to achieve the common good, mm -hmm. you know, to make sure that there's a basic standard for everybody uh, that's out there. Now, um, when we're dealing with God, uh, you know, we're normally dealing with the what we call distributive commutative mm -hmm. justice in the sense of God is dealing with equity, right? Mm -hmm. So he's looking for the virtue of being a fair and equitable person. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's what we're dealing with. Now, in the Old Testament, there's no doubt that God uh, it does have a retributive justice component. There's no doubt about that. And, and of course, even punishing people for the sins of their fathers to the fourth generation, which is said, you know, both uh, uh, in Leviticus and in um, Exodus and in Deuteronomy. So we get this retributive uh, part of Torah uh, and the retributive uh, part of justice uh, being, um, and, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, as, as one of the characteristics or attributes of God. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in the New Testament, the retributive part 
uh, in other words, I'm going to punish you for doing something wrong, is, is less emphasized. Paul even saying, you know, um, in his many statements that Jesus has rescued us from the wrath of God. Mm. Remember, wrath in this sense does not mean anger, like a rage, an oh. emotional uh, rage. The wrath of God is an expression that means the just deserts of human beings for their inequities uh, in their conduct in the world. So Jesus, uh, says St. Paul, has rescued us mm -hmm. from the just deserts. Um, you know, that uh, if, if we have faith in him and we try to follow him, he will rescue us from the, our just deserts, what we ought to get for, you know, the inequities, inequities of our life. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, a person who doesn't have uh, uh, you know, faith or doesn't believe uh, in uh, not only uh, Jesus, but doesn't even try to follow God mm -hmm. by, you know, his own conscience, that person, says St. Paul, is still subject to just deserts, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if, you, if you're not going to follow God, right, then you're going to get, you know, uh, what's coming to you um, by your own conscience, uh, according to St. Paul. Mm -hmm. But if you have faith in, in Christ or you're trying to follow uh, the, the Lord uh, according to, you know, the, you know, the, your, uh, the dictates of your conscience, mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, the, the, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus mm -hmm. can rescue you uh, from um, your, the wrath of God that is to come. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the, the emphasis in the New Testament is not placed at all on retributive justice, okay. uh, though there is um, a, a sense of that in the Matthew 25 passage mm -hmm. where the king does separate the sheep from the goats and, and you know, um, the per people who are trying to help their neighbor mm -hmm. uh, get their just desserts in heaven and the people who didn't attempt to help their neighbor uh, uh, are, are sent to a place where that is, you know, um, uh, you know, um, um, as it were, what they deserve right. uh, because of what they did in this life. So there is that uh, passage which is, you know, uh, a very unusual passage in the New Testament, mm -hmm. but it's definitely, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of has a retributive uh, uh, dimension to it. Mm -hmm. um, so it right. has so, to be reconciled. So we, uh, it, we always yeah, hear it has to be about reconciled the, with right. other passages. Right, and, and we always hear about the sheep's and the goat. Uh, so were we all goats before we believed in Christ, and then that turns yeah, us into sheep, you know. and that's how the differentiation there is. And so obviously, like you said. Clearly, somebody was going to punishment. Clearly, our Lord indicated that that uh, mm -hmm. hell, uh, Gehenna, uh, was populated, mm -hmm. and certainly, uh, yeah. you know, somebody's there. Yeah. Uh, so there. Oh yeah. Uh, so I guess that's the question that sometimes people get confused over the idea of mercy. And let's talk about you know the the idea that in God's mercy overcoming that, but thinking that somehow that gets me off the hook of everything. And the other question I have is when people you said people's conscience. And the, the thing is, that's an informed conscience, right? That means that one right. is... Right. Uh, well, you have to inform right. it right. as best you can. Right. So a person who doesn't have very much to work with in terms of informing their conscience, they, they haven't even heard of Jesus, that's one thing. But, you know, people who have uh, heard, right. uh, you know, uh, of Jesus and, and, and do believe that, that he is credible, uh, you know, that's another matter. You, you have to try to inform your right. conscience to the best extent that right. you can. No question about that. Right. And, and just with respect to, you know, again, that passage <clears throat> from Matthew, it's hard to know how to read the passage mm -hmm. because Jesus generally does not talk about retributive justice. Mm -hmm. So is this a prophetic warning? Mm -hmm. In other words, that if you keep living a life that's conscienceless, mm -hmm. if you keep living a life where you turn a, a blind eye to your neighbor and you have mm -hmm. no heart of compassion at all right. for people in need, um, then he's sort of warning you you're just shaping your whole future to the point right. where you're going to choose in the end. Right. You're, you're going to choose, you know, this hell. So I, I really uh, think that if you read, you know, right. the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John um, pretty carefully, 
you know, it's right. you're not going to see a lot of Jesus out there sending right. people to hell. Right. Um, you know, um, you know, in terms of retributive justice, right. uh, you're going to see the predominance of mercy. However, in the same breath, Jesus does warn everyone: the more you keep doing these right. things, the more you keep being uncompassionate well, or turning a blind right. eye the more you 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 know uh, reject me and reject god you're you're setting up your own fate right. to well, choose it, is it because you know, of the, the fact, illusion right the, yeah. in a sense i think a lot of us think that there's, there's this i have a choice to make and i make this one time choice kind of like you know once saved always yeah. saved where really yeah. what we're talking about is a series of choices people are making throughout their life that lead them on that's that correct path, right that's absolutely correct. And it begins, as St. Thomas would tell us, to form habits. Mm -hmm. And then, as you know, it's really hard to break habits, right. you know, once they're really solidified. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, you've kind of habitualized uh, being a hard-hearted rat, mm -hmm. you know, then, <laughs> you know, after a while, you naturally choose it. Right. It becomes, as St. Thomas would say, second nature to you. Right. And then, of course, to try and break with it at the last minute is a very difficult thing to do. Right. So, um, you know, he, Jesus, that's why Jesus can be so strong mm -hmm. uh, in warning the Pharisees. That's why I think he's so strong in Matthew 25 about the sheep and the goats. That's mm -hmm. why he's so strong in the Gospel of Luke with respect to the parable of Lazarus and the rich man mm -hmm. and so forth. Right. Okay, here's another question. Father, mm -hmm. uh, last week you addressed the question about agape love being genuine. As a former enabler, I struggle when I read about agape love in your books as I always used to feel compelled to say yes to requests asked of me. Can you further delineate the difference between agape love and enabling, i.e., how to protect healthy boundaries uh, or have healthy boundaries and still practice agape love? This is from Mike. Yeah, Mike, that's a really great question and, and there is a very important distinction between the two. Remember that agape love, first and foremost, it is self-sacrificial love. Yes, it is trying uh, to, to, to respond to people in compassion. But the first point about agape love that cannot be forgotten is that it seeks the good of the person served. And so you have to find out what is the good? What's the true good for that person served? So, you know, enabling them to get an abortion it might you might think well I'm just trying to be compassionate and nice mm -hmm. but is this really seeking the good for that person you might be uh, you know feel that you are compassionate and 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 nice and but on the other hand what are you doing mm -hmm. what is the reality you are actuating in the world you're helping a person to kill an innocent human being. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you might feel good about it, but you're not doing a good thing. First of all, you're not doing a good thing for the baby that's about to be killed. Secondly, what are you doing to that person who th now you have reinforced you know, to, to believe that, that sort of this, this murder is okay. Mm -hmm. You know, that this killing of an innocent is okay. You know, I mean, it's just, you're enabling them to habitualize it. So the first question ever and always when we're seeking agape love is, what is the true good for that person? Mm -hmm. What is the true good for all the parties concerned around me? What is the true good uh, even for me mm -hmm. in the midst of serving these goods? And if we don't ask those questions about the true good, and we know the true good, right? Mm -hmm. It's right there in the Ten Commandments. It's right there, uh, you know, in uh, uh, you know the, the the prohibitions that that uh, you know the, the you know the church makes very plain in its explicitation mm -hmm. of the Ten Commandments in the Catechism. It's all right there, right? So so we know what the true good is. We mm -hmm. know. How, how to help people to become uh, not just the best version of themselves. We know how to help people to become Christ-like. Mm -hmm. and, and that goes beyond, as it were, 
uh, you know, uh, 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 just a best version of me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's uh, it's to become like him, to become like him in goodness, and and to become like him in mercy, and to mm -hmm. become like him in, in justice, and to become like him in all the aspects of of, of agape love, the gentle heartedness uh, of the beatitudes, the humble heartedness of the beatitudes, you know, and and uh, the mercy and compassion mm -hmm. of the beatitudes, and the peacemaking of the beatitudes. So so you know that's that's where we want to go. Okay. And, and so uh, you know my my thought is you know. In, in many ways, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, to to say, uh, educate yourself. Y you already are educated, Mike. Otherwise, you wouldn't be asking this question. Mm -hmm. But the main thing to remember is, you know, keep that in the forefront of your mind, and you won't be an enabler. Right. But if you don't keep that in the forefront of your mind, you're going to operate on your feelings alone without the direction of prudence and your rationality and your knowledge of who Christ is and who Christ wants you to become and who you want to become in Christ. And in that case, you're going to be an enabler. Very good, because I know my mother used to talk about misguided compassion or false compassion. With that oh, being yeah. the case, we're going to take a break here from Father Spitzer. He'll be back momentarily as we will be. Stay with us much more ahead in the heart of Father Spitzer's universe, intersection of faith and reason. Stay with us. And we are here in Father Spitzer's universe. We're going to be talking about the universality of Christ's salvation. What does that really mean as we turn once again to Father Spitzer? One more question from our audience before we sure. tackle uh, that topic or finalize that topic. Here's a question that came to us from Facebook. Dear Father Spitzer, what should you do when you're going through a dark night for years and seem to have no one to talk to about it? What should you do? Question mark. Is there a way to find an effective spiritual director for this? If so, how would you go about it? This is Laurie. And I know one of the questions for the great Thomas Dubé, Father Thomas Dubé for many years when I talked to him about his books was always the tough part was actually finding a good spiritual director. But what about somebody who thinks they're going through the, the dark night? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a, a little bit of a checklist, but Laura, if you're uh, uh, going through uh, uh, a, a long period of uh, not just aridity, but uh, also a kind of, uh, you know, deprivation of uh, sensing the presence of God. Of course, he's always present, but that uh, sensing the presence of God, uh, there may be, uh, you know, um, uh, just uh, the purification that uh, St. John of the Cross talks about, uh, which is a long period of, of time, uh, but it could also be for other reasons. Uh, now, I have a little checklist that I've uh, put together mm -hmm. on, you know, uh, how to, you know, before you say this is the dark night mm -hmm. of St. John of the Cross, you, you got to check out first, uh, you know, are there some uh, possible physiological roots of maybe a depression mm -hmm. um, and uh, so you should uh, get a good medical checkup uh, just to indicate you know um, to somebody if you, especially if you've been uh, not just uh, in a sense of aridity or mm -hmm. not sensing the presence of God but in, in in a funk that's pretty much described by a depression hard to get up uh, in in the morning hard to see any good in the future mm -hmm. you know some real um, uh, you know, darkness that, mm -hmm. that uh, is sort of uh, foreboding this kind of overshadowing you. If that's what you're feeling, I'd, I'd really suggest just uh, telling your physician about it just to get a blood test to see if there might be something uh, either hormonally or something physiologically that's going on. Mm -hmm. the, the second thing in the checklist is, again, if it looks more like a depression than, than um, what we might call spiritual desolation, uh, then I would um, uh, probably want to just examine your past life. Is there mm -hmm. something that happened, something traumatic? Is there something going on naturally in your life that, that might produce psychologically mm -hmm. 
uh, a state of temporary depression. Um, you know, if, uh, if, if you were clinically depressed, there'd probably be some physiological signs of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that'd be a second thing that you want to check out. Always remember, grace builds on nature, mm -hmm. so you want to check out the two natural parts first. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the third thing, you know, that, that might be going on, honestly, is, is um, uh, there might be, um, uh, uh, you know, something spiritual that's that's going on mm -hmm. and you just want to make sure you've been going to confession mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know if you're feeling this desolation you might want to pick up your confession schedule maybe going once a month mm -hmm. there might be something that that uh, is, is bothering you uh, uh, going on in your life or just to take out one of those um, uh, like our uh, National Catholic Register for example has uh, you know an examination of conscience that's mm -hmm. on the website right. you might want to just take a look at that and start going down that list and seeing if there's something on that list that, that that's uh, disturbing you or maybe you know um, you know the evil spirit is just kind of uh, goading you mm -hmm. or the Holy Spirit is trying to get you to look at something more deeply but I take out that uh, Mm -hmm. um, National Catholic Register uh, Examination of Conscience. It's a good one there. And just examine it and just see if there's something there uh, that you may want to um, uh, attend to um, and, and talk maybe to a, a good confessor about. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would pick up the pace of the confession. I would also pick up the pace if you can go to weekly mass, I mean, that is to say, to go to a mass mm -hmm. during the week. So maybe can schedule maybe a Wednesday or a Thursday to go to mass as, as well as on Sundays, mm -hmm. something of that nature. That might actually help. Mm -hmm. But the first thing, always go to the physical. Mm -hmm. Second thing, go to the emotional, psychological. Check those, get those things off the checklist. Mm -hmm. If not, that may be the source of a depression. Thirdly, then go to the spiritual part of it, and that would be to the part where um, um, you know you're, you're basically dealing with is there something going on morally or religiously, uh, you know, that I need to attend to, mm -hmm. or can I pick up my spirit religious devotion? Am I being called to you know to pick up my religious conversion, moral conversion, by attending? Uh, mass more often, receiving the, the Lord and the sacrament more mm -hmm. often, and going to confession more often, or something of that right. nature, or attending to a particular sin that might be going on. The fourth one on the checklist, um, and this is would be a real dark night. Mm -hmm. Now remember the distinction I made a long, long time ago. Maybe you never even heard of mm -hmm. heard it, Lord. But if you didn't, here's the the quick thing. There's affective consolation and desolation on the one hand, and spiritual consolation and desolation on the other hand. Affective consolation would be a feeling of sublime peace, of unity, of being at home with God, or even consolations which are ecstatic, that are, are very much stabs of joy, or you know, um, uh, just even uh, remembrances of stabs of joy, uh, which are unitative, uh, or even you know, very peace-filled, etc. Mm -hmm. Affective desolation is what you might be experiencing right now. And affective desolation really means that you are s feeling a sense of discord, mm -hmm. no peace, right? So that there's something going on in your life that's very dark, foreboding, unpeaceful, sapping of energy, um, and, and even sapping of hope. Mm -hmm. so, so that would be an affective desolation. Now let's uh, zip over to the other hand. Spiritual consolation is an increase in trust in God, hope in your salvation, and love. That is to say agape love, that charitable love that we have been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and, a, and a spiritual desolation is the opposite. That's where you have a decrease in trust in mm -hmm. God, decrease in um, hope in your salvation, decrease in agape love. So you can always define it by 1 Corinthians 13, right? So love is patient, so a decrease in patience. Love is kind, a decrease in kindness. Love is uh, merciful, right? A decrease in mercy, decrease in, in uh, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. not growing angry, etc. Okay, so all these things, if you put it together, now you, the way you know you're in a, a dark night of the soul, say like Mother Teresa was, mm -hmm. if you have affective desolation, 
but you do not have spirit, spiritual desolation. So essentially, you've got these terrible feelings of, of darkness, of just being alone, of being you know, in a desert, this aridity, right, of being isolated, of not having a future. So you've got these feelings on the one hand. But on the other hand, you're not experiencing a decrease in trust, hope, and love, but rather might even be experiencing, experiencing an increase in trust, hope, and love. That's a real dark night of the soul. So that's Mother Teresa, for example, was not going through, a, you know, she was not going through spiritual desolation. Mm -hmm. She was maintaining oh, okay. or increasing her trust in God, hope, and salvation, and her, uh, you know, ability to love. I mean, look at her ability to love. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I rest my case, you know, but on the other hand, uh, she certainly was going through affective desolation. And if that's the case, then that truly is a time of purification. The Lord is helping you to purify yourself from sensuality and egocentricity. Mm -hmm. And if he's really doing that, then you're going to get a benefit of increase in trust, hope, and love in the long uh, run. So that's going to be a good deal in the long run. So uh, as far as a good spiritual director, I would say uh, you may want to contact somebody. Uh, I, I, you know, I would recommend mm -hmm. uh, you know the Carmelites or the Jesuits who have a great deal of, uh, a, a, you know, who have a great deal of experience. Not all Jesuits, not all Carmelites have a great deal of experience uh, in this kind of discernment. But you can go to some great Carmelite mm -hmm. spiritual directors, some great Jesuit spiritual directors who do have a great deal of experience. Uh, the, the Carmelites, um, I, I don't know where you're located, but uh, uh, there's generally some very good right. Carmelite um, uh, monasteries in, in various places that right. you could uh, go to. Okay, very good. Uh, let's move quickly in the closing minutes to talk a little bit about what's going on here as the universality of Jesus' salvation. We kind of okay. talked about the inclusive version more the last time, and we, we, we touched on the, the kind of a view that maybe it's a little more restricted and of course the John 14 16 14 6 I should say no one comes to the Father but by me let's talk about why mm -hmm. that doesn't indicate that it's restricted yeah because what Jesus is saying and and this is the way the the Vatican Council fathers interpreted it and I think very properly in in John's gospel is that when Jesus is saying that he's saying I am the conduit to the Father for all people of all faiths it, it, everywhere in the world. No one is going to come to the Father except through me. I am the Son. I am the Mediator. I am the, the Emmanuel. I am the one who has come down from heaven. I am the one who has, as it were, through my action of, of unconditional love, coming into the world as an incarnate human, human being, have made myself a mediator for you to go to the Father. I have brought the kingdom of God in my own person. So, you know, no one's going to come to the Father except through me of, you know, every faith, any faith. So that's the first thing. So this is, this passage has to be read in a universalistic mm -hmm. sense. So he's not saying that if you have never heard of me, mm -hmm. then tough luck. You know, you know, I just, uh, I got to say, it was an accident of birth, and I got, I'm sorry to tell you this, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, you were uh, born in XYZ country, and you never heard about Christianity, and I'm so sorry, uh, you just got to go to hell, uh, because, uh, you know, um, uh, you, right. you didn't explicitly believe in me. Kind of some kind and, of, and that's, that is your hard predestination read. kind of thing that, you know, from the beginning Absolutely. of time, you're in and you're out, and it doesn't really matter. That's right. And, of course, you know, the, the whole idea that I have to intentionally believe in Jesus mm -hmm. in order for the, the benefits of Jesus' passion and death, the, the act of unconditional love that saved the world from the, our sins, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, mm -hmm. right? You know, the, you know, it's meant in a very uh, universal sense. The, the point, of course, uh, is John means it in a very universal sense. Mm -hmm. So it, you don't want to be re reading restrictions in there. And last week when we talked about, you know, belief, mm -hmm. you have to be very careful about the word belief and unbelief. Right. Unbelief does not mean that 
you know, you didn't hear, and therefore you didn't believe, you didn't hear the word of, of, of a missionary, let's say, and you, therefore you didn't believe, and therefore uh, you weren't a Christian. That's not what unbelief means. Mm -hmm. Unbelief in the Gospel of John, which can be validated by really good textual criticism mm -hmm. of all the texts, clearly points to the fact unbelief means that you rejected, knowingly rejected the Word, mm -hmm. knowingly rejected Jesus, and knowingly rejected His Word of love. That's what unbelief means. So be very, very careful because the connotations in English are not the same as they are um, in both Greek and in um, uh, Aramaic. And also the cultural uh, uh, notion of belief, you have to look at all the texts to find out what uh, belief and unbelief really means. Mm -hmm. So don't read an exclusivistic sense of, of, of unbelief in there, and you should be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it will come together and, and make very good sense for you. Well, one of the points, too, I think sometimes when people hear this, or even this topic, this universality mm -hmm. of Jesus' salvation, they think that mm -hmm. means that, well, everybody is going to heaven. Ah, no, that's not what it means. It means that everyone you know, uh, Christ made his salvation available right. for anyone, and here's the key, who wants it? Mm -hmm. For anyone who is willing to follow him if they knew, knew him, right? For anyone uh, who is trying to follow God according to the dictates of their conscience, what they knew, yes, he makes it available mm -hmm. for all those who want it who would take it, uh, and, and I think that's the, the most important thing. You are free individuals. Uh, everybody's uh, made in the, in the image and likeness of God has that freedom, right? And, and so you have to want that. You have to want to embrace uh, that word of God. You have to want to embrace the word of love from Jesus. You have to want to follow him as the risen one, as the one who gave his Holy Spirit into the world, which is manifest through not only uh, his miracles uh, in the first century, but mm -hmm. his miracles today, which are prolific. And so, uh, um, you know, all these things uh, mm -hmm. being said, right. you know, um, uh, follow him and, and, you know, you will be able, or, you know, the intention to want to follow him, uh, you know, if you could have done so, mm -hmm. that is the, the key. But it's availability. It is not everybody gets into heaven. Right. That it's, it's, he makes it available for those who, are, who want it and who are willing to follow him in order to get it. Okay, you also say, it is reasonable then to infer that Jesus' intention was to offer salvation to every person seeking God with a sincere heart. This interpretation is verified mm -hmm. in subsequent Christian doctrine. How so? Mm -hmm. uh, well, of course, the two doctrines that we, well, first of all, um, you know, we see it, you know, in um, the uh, definition of mortal sin, and we've mm -hmm. talked about that many times, right, that, you know, um, uh, you know people, uh, you know, just can't commit a mortal sin. Um, you know, by doing something that's grievously wrong, you have to have sufficient reflection and full consent of the will. Mm -hmm. That is to say, there are no impediments to the free use of the will. Secondly, the two doctrines we talked about last time that came up in the uh, pastoral constitution of the church, Gaudium et Spes, and the uh, dogmatic constitution of the church, Lumen Gentium, uh, where, uh, you know, it explicitly says mm -hmm. that um, the, the doctrine, the, the council fathers explicitly say, um, you know, that that um, uh, those who are sincerely trying to follow God according to the dictates of their conscience, right, they too, through the actions, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, they too can inherit the benefits of salvation wrought by Jesus. So, uh, and that's made very explicit in Gaudium et Spes as well in the pastoral constitution of the church. You also mentioned here that, uh, you know, this whole idea of Jesus' offer of salvation all, uh, you know, where people couldn't be baptized initially and the early church struggled. Yeah. You, you talk about Ambrose, et cetera, yeah. dealing with that yeah. concern and getting into the uh, baptism of desire, right? That is correct because, you know, uh, the baptism by desire is uh, for, that is the second century wording of what comes out in the later Vatican Council. In other words, uh, somebody who really 
Uh, now, in this case, you know, it, by desire could mean uh, I, I explicitly desire it, and I'm a catechumen, for example, but I haven't been baptized yet, uh, you know, but I, I wanted to be baptized, but somebody, let's say, uh, you know, um, I, I died of a disease. Uh, he would say, yes, that was, you're already baptized by desire. Uh, the same thing would hold true because remember, uh, they were dealing with the question, you know, well, wait a minute, what happened to all the people uh, of the Old Testament or all the people who lived before Christ? I mean, how could that be? I mean, obviously, they weren't baptized. Obviously, they didn't hear the, the Word of God. I mean, are they all going to hell as well? You know, right. and of course, the answer is no. I mean, if all those people, there, there were people, uh, according to the dictates of their own conscience uh, back in the Old Testament times who are non-Jewish people mm -hmm. who were trying to follow God according to the dictates of their own conscience. And, 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 and uh, they were, uh, again, they're going to be judged according to that. But, uh, you know, if, if they were good in trying to, to do this and follow uh, the Lord and they're, they're seeking God and they're, they're seeking, they're trying to follow Him according to the dictates of their conscience. And, uh, you know, yes, they too can benefit mm -hmm. from uh, Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection from His unconditional act of love that rescues us in the world. So uh, all that being said, um, you know, even okay. people in the Old Testament, and of course Ambrose would have included that in the baptism by desire. Mm -hmm. So uh, okay. in other words, even ret you know, retroactively. Um, you know, uh, retro so. retroactively. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. and kind of that kind of thing. That uh, leaps to the question, which I know I brought up before, it said, uh, well, if everyone of goodwill can be saved, what is the point of Christian evangelization? I know we brought that up before, saying, well, if everybody's okay yeah. and I'm, I'm living with the light I've been given, uh, why bother anybody? Why should I go and yeah. risk having my fingers cut off by some people who are unhappy with me telling them <laughs> about the truth? <laughs> yeah, well, there's just there two dimensions to that. First of all, of course, you want to avoid, you know, uh, any kind of culpable ignorance or mm -hmm. culpable non-action, um, you know, towards something that you know. Uh, that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, um, and, uh, and so you don't want to purposely avoid, uh, you know, uh, uh, Christianity because that might cost you something. Mm -hmm. uh, then you really wouldn't be following God according to the dictates of your conscience. So you're, you're talking about this person who's kind of in the middle. Mm -hmm. So they're not Christians yet, but, you know, they, they, they say, well, you know, I've got this option to become a Christian. Sounds true to me, mm -hmm. you know, but, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think I'm going to go there because these Christians are getting persecuted right now, let's say. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think I'll avoid that, um, you know, and uh, uh, I'd, I'd rather just uh, live a, a more of a comfortable life. Whoa, mm -hmm. then you're already dictated, uh, you're already, uh, you know, um, uh, judged by the dictates of your own conscience. You right. know better, but you're avoiding it. And, and so that, that's, uh, that's in your case. I think the case we talked about last week was mm -hmm. the case of, you know, why would anybody bother to evangelize mm -hmm. uh, Christianity? Oh, they're going to be saved uh, anyway. You know, and of course, the, the answer is to bring the good news mm -hmm. to those people. Why would you let people languish? for example, not ever having heard of the unconditional love of God, never having heard of the parable of the prodigal son and its implications, not ever having heard that God loved the world so much that he would die for us in an incarnate embodied mm -hmm. state so that he could be with us and save us, mm -hmm. not ever having heard that, that eternal life is eternal love with him, not even having heard that there is such a thing as an eternal life. Remember, for many, many years of Judaism, right, uh, you know, all the way, you know, maybe uh, up to uh, the time of the prophets, and then in the later years of Judaism, before wisdom literature, you know, uh, the, the idea of resurrection was almost non- you know, existent. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just wasn't even on people's radar screen. Why would you just not want to let people know about the resurrection from the dead? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, why wouldn't you want to let people know the good news? That's the first thing. Mm 
Right. The, the sec that's why you'd want to evangelize them. Second reason is, uh, you know, and I think we mentioned this, uh, you know, in some respect last mm -hmm. time, you've got old Cortez going there into, into Mexico, mm -hmm. and he's looking at, you know, well, wait a minute here. Uh, you, what do you mean you're eliminating hundreds of thousands of people by human sacrifices? Right. I'm prohibiting that today, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, why wouldn't you want to bring mm -hmm. um, people up to the fullest level of moral conversion um, that you could possibly bring right. them to? Because that gives them purification of their right. souls right now. You're starting the process of purification toward unconditional love. Why leave them in a state where they're never going right. to hear about the objective of unconditional love? They're never going to hear about the teaching of Jesus. And so they never ever start their purification toward that ideal, right. toward that goal, away from the deadly sins, and the question, toward the virtues right, that, the, that define and, love. Right. And the question for us then is to whom much is given, much is expected. And we're going to be asked why we were given the gift of faith and didn't spread it. And that is something we're going yeah. to be held accountable for. So we have to think about it even from that side yeah. of the equation. With that being said, we've got to ask for your blessing, Father. Oh, all right. And please bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May the Lord of all consolation, of all mercy and all love, send his spirit down upon you to tell you in your conscious, in your subconscious mind, who he is and the hope that you should have for salvation, the confidence that you should have in following him and doing your best through the sacraments, through the church, and through your acts of the will to follow him into the fullness of light and life so that you might spread that truth in the spirit of evangelization to all whom you touch in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. We shall see you next week. And hopefully for all of our audience out there as well, we'll see you. As you can see, the wonderful books, just some of the many, along with wonderful DVDs and shows available through our EW10 religious catalog, EW10RC.com. Credible Catholic, a wonderful website as well. Next week, we'll be talking about the effects of Jesus' teaching on world culture. We need it now. I'm Doug Keck. We'll see you next time. I'll be waving you in at the intersection of faith and reason. That's next week.